God despises syncretism, taking the practices of ancient pagan religions and thinking you can sanctify it to honor God. And yet Tilden Edwards, the head of the Shalem Institute in Washington, one of the most prominent contemplative training centers in the country, has said, what makes a practice Christian or not Christian isn't its source, it's its intent. So what Tilden Edwards, along with many others in the emergent and contemplative movement are saying, is that we can embrace these practices, these principles, these teachings from ancient pagan mystery religions, sanctify them by sprinkling Christian terminology. If our intent is to honor God with it, then by definition they assume God will accept it and be pleased with it, not according to the Word of God. The Word of God says they are bringing strange fire into the church. The term New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. So they call it New Spirituality. But in the church, we find it in many different forms. The Emerging Movement, the Positive Confession Movement, the Word Faith Movement, the Contemplative Movement, the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. So basically, it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. We have a very clever adversary who knows how to redefine and reinvent the Christian faith. And that's what we're watching happen right before our very eyes. In the world religions, there's always been this, uh, this fascination with the mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. Now, we have that all the way back within Christianity through the Gnostics and then through the, the Desert Fathers and, and the Middle Ages and, and uh, a lot of the mysticism that came through Catholicism. But those things were kind of more out on the margins. Uh, they were only in, in particular groups of people within denominations. What we're finding now is that that is hitting the mainstream of Christianity. Barbara Marks Hubbard, probably the almost the, the matriarch of today's contemporary New Age movement, has a book called Emergence, the shift from ego to essence, 10 steps to the universal human. David Spangler, father of the New Age, called the shaman of the New Age, has a book called Emergence, the Rebirth of the Sacred, the God Within. The book As Above, So Below, written by the editors of New Age magazine, talk about the emergent spirituality and they talk all about contemplative prayer and esoteric Christianity. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. He discovered that these practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. Thomas Keating popularized the movement called centering, where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit, through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And actually, Thomas Keating has acknowledged that that practice of contemplative meditation, even in its Christianized version, is identical to the Eastern meditation and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the kundalini demonic force to rise up even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. One thing that, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems 
is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. We are being told, not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but by many who are now in leadership, that we need to have spiritual experiences for an authentic faith. As far as Christianity is concerned, the corruption is coming into the church from outside. We're embracing those things that God speaks nothing of in Scripture unless He's speaking against it. And a lot of Christian leaders are really devaluing the Bible. And that's really very common in the, in the merging, emerging New Spirituality Church. The Bible is really reliable, and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups, Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses who's helped develop many programs, he was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church. It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or a study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community, and by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up, not surprisingly, by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective, where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation, talking about God's dream. Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream, and both the New Age and the church, Erwin McManus used the term, uses the term God's dream. It's a metaphor for the coming world peace. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion. And it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one world government, a one world religion, which would bring a utopia on earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like. The idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became, in the 1940s and 50s, the Latter Rain Movement. An offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God, and part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham. One of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God, we were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in 
believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Unless you are looking to the word of God, you have no way of testing what these prophets who are coming predicting and prophesying in the name of God are saying to you. Sadly, we do know that uh, that the world itself will turn its back on Israel in the latter days. Uh, we see the, the, um, the nuts and bolts being put together right now, the nations that are arraying themselves against Israel, they're all in place right now as we speak. Anybody who takes the Bible seriously and what it teaches will always see Israel as the apple of God's eye and do everything to their last drop of blood to defend them. Jerusalem, it's the seat of worship and it'll be the place where uh, when God restores all things to their, their former self, the church needs to be aware of how we treat Israel and how we should be praying for them. If you do not know solid doctrine, if you do not know the signs of the end of the age, if you do not know what the original in Scripture looks like, how will you test when the counterfeits come, claiming to be from the word of the living God? The Bible should act as our anchor or as our mooring uh, so that we're just not carried around wherever the, the tide wants to take us. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. Traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Um, the message of much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. The devil doesn't want people to be focused on what's to come. He wants us to be very much engaged with the things going on down here on earth. If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it's going to change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth, until we fix everything down here and that everybody's going to eventually get to heaven anyway, you can go ahead and take a very, very uh, uncommitted view of your Christianity. You can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. Our young people are not going to be reached through emergent gimmicks and techniques, through candles or labyrinths, through pizza parties, through chanting parties, through meditation techniques and yoga seminars. These young people aren't going to be reached because you are conforming the gospel to their culture, but because you are bringing the gospel to them in their culture and saying to them, the Lord is relevant for you today, for his gospel, his word of salvation is what will bring you into that relationship with God without the use of gimmicks or occult techniques. What makes a Christian? Not the church that you go to. It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? Wide is the Gate, Volume 2. Available Summer 2012. With your pre-sale purchase of Why Does the Gate, The Emerging New Christianity, you will also receive this DVD teaching tool entitled Falling to Pieces, valued at $20. the way, the truth, and the life. His light shines in the darkness, but darkness does not comprehend the true light. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, our world displays a form of godliness, but has denied the power of the one true God. We embrace the lie because the father of lies masquerades as an angel of light. He uses pieces of the truth to shape the lie, so the lie appears to be the truth. How can we recognize the difference between the truth and the lie? 
the enemy ingeniously crafts the lie to appear as light. Charity, benevolence, enlightenment, purpose, mind, body, spirit, coexist, world peace, tolerance, justice, politically correct, heavenly, angelic, but denies the true light of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Is God behind the world peace movement? Would Jesus preach the coexist gospel? Is the Holy Spirit part of the mind-body-spirit craze? See to it that the light within you is not darkness. The pieces of the ultimate delusion are falling into place, just as the Bible foretold. White is the Gate, Volume 2, available Summer 2012.